stuff. So is Burnt Ridge Nursery. I get a lot of my plants, or traditionally I got a lot of plants from them. Now I just propagate on my own mostly. Uh, but this, I really highly, I really love this, um, this golden autumn olive. Uh, it's beautiful too. When the sun is coming through a tree full of this fruit, it's exquisite. Um, just look at that. I mean, psh, you eat them, it's like eating sunshine. I grow, look at that. And I grow them, I shape my autumn olives into like single trunk trees and I prune them and they just like some of the most beautiful edible landscape, uh, you know, fruit trees on our, on our landscape, which is saying something. We got a lot of beauties here. All right, jujube. So the jujube is one of the most common fruits in Asia. It's uh, one of the top 50 Chinese medicines as well. Uh, small ornamental tree, 12, maybe 15 feet tall. Um, very pretty, glossy leaves, unaffected by disease and insects. Produces these fruits that, um, what would I compare them to? Like a large date in size. When they're fresh on the tree, they taste like a apple with like a, like a caramel almond flavor to them. Leave them on the tree, and as they begin to uh, ripen, their sugars condense and they become more date-like. Now, of course, in Asia and other places, they'll further take them and, and sort of cook them in a honey and make like a natural dessert, real, you know, natural candy. Imagine that. Um, very productive. Look at the green leaves. Gorgeous. Uh, very pretty. Again, this likes a little bit warmer. Um, I've also found it likes a drier soil. Actually, these can be grown in the desert. That's how dry they'll take it. Um, so if you have a swaler, you know, some kind of raised area or dry area you have, try the jujube. Uh, it'll, it'll grow slower in a heavier clay soil, but uh, still grows. Again, uh, Mike McConkey down there, Edible Landscaping, has a lot of good jujubes. Um, sort of the previously mentioned mail order nurseries. Lee and Lang are kind of a safe bet. Uh, for a pear, you do need them to cross pollinate. I'm a real big fan of the, the contorted one, sometimes called so, so. Big fan of that. Very attractive, very pretty, and also is productive. There's a large, lovely jujube, uh, all different shapes, from elongated to you know shorter and plump. Um, there's there's quite a quite a whole universe of um, jujubes out there. Okay, this is aronia. This is the black aronia, uh, which has a terrible common name called chokeberry, which I'm renaming. I'm renaming this wonderberry, all right? So this is a quote-unquote native, beautiful. It's in the apple family, so it's got pretty leaves. It's an upright shrub uh, in full sun, quite happy. You're looking at anywhere from eight to 12 feet. I do recommend the cultivars, uh, especially Viking. Viking is very productive. Um, it's probably going to stay around eight feet or so in height. Um, they create these big droops of berries that are very easy to pick. And I tell you, when it comes to harvesting fruit, it's usually not as romantic as people think, uh, but the aronia is very easy to pick, and you usually get them before the birds. The birds usually do not eat these when they're ripe. They will going into winter and other periods, but in our area, uh, and we got lots of birds, we can get out there and we can harvest them quickly and easily, typically here in August. So it's like, a, it's nice, it's coming, it's a fruit coming in when a lot of other stuff isn't, so it's, you know, you can focus on it. Now, you don't want to eat it right at hand or you will choke. It's a very astringent. But when you cook it down, it's delicious. It takes on a deep berry flavor, uh, something very much like elderberry, uh, and it makes it makes good. My probably my my family's favorite jam. Uh, you can make syrups with it. Really good wine. Cider makers are working with the aronia a lot because it adds sort of a almost like a, you know, that, that, that dry aftertaste that a good old fashioned cider has. So a lot of cideries are growing aronia with their apples and making it into their cider blends. So even just for that, check it out. Very medicinal, again, dark purple, black berries, very medicinal for you. Uh, we also make syrup out of it. And then I put them in these uh, ice cubes, these whiskey ball ice cubes I got. And then the kids eat them, you know, I, I mix in, I'll do like a gumi, aronia, elderberry, 
uh, you know, sort of a little frozen ice cube bowl and maybe a little bit of honey in there and the kids, man, they love it and it's healthy. Dig it. Um, makes a great mixer too. Great mixing syrup for mixed drinks. And then again, beautiful, very productive, uh, awesome, beautiful fall foliage color. Again, very edible landscape um, character here. Look at that as a hedge. I mean, you can plant them because they grow upright, uh, very vertical. So, you know, I would, you know, if I was going to grow them in hedge, I'd probably do them on six to eight foot centers. Uh, you, 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 would, you would get a beautiful hedge out of that. All right, here's another video I don't think is going to work. So it's all right, I'm running out of time anyway. Okay, I'm going to throw in there real quick mulberries because a lot of folks aren't aware that there are select mulberries that are very different than the wild bird seeded mulberries that you might have tried, which are good. They're sweet, insipid, maybe not a whole lot else. There are mulberries that are very complex in flavor that are some of the best berries you've ever had. Uh, are also very long and large. This is Illinois Everbearing there on the right, which is one of the best cultivars, period. So, so Illinois Everbearing, highly recommend. Um, and it'll produce on and off, often out throughout the summer, it has a long fruiting period. Uh, so I do recommend looking into the mulberry select varieties. Uh, and this tree, the mulberry, has impressed me the most for a tree that will fruit in shade. Yes, I've seen the mulberry fruit pretty generously in pretty dense shade. And I can't say that about anything else. Partial shade, I should run over this real quick. Partial shade, you'll get some fruit out of pawpaws, some fruit out of elderberries, some fruit out of aronia, some fruit out of gumi, some fruit out of gooseberries, right? And probably a few other characters, raspberries but only some in relative to how much light it gets, right? June berries too, all right? But the mulberry, I've been impressed. So if you've got a shady spot and you're dying for some fruit, check out the mulberries. Illinois Everbearing, uh, yeah. And then another phenomenal, very unique uh, plant is the Flying Dragon Citrus. This is an orange tree that grows up into zone six, outside in the snow, and very productive, lots of these little small oranges. Uh, what would be the equivalent? Um, kind of like maybe the size of like a, a round plum. And they're more like a sour lemon, bitter lemon, uh, rather than an orange. Um, but it's, it's great for, you get the juice you can get out of it, it makes a great sort of bitters mix uh, for your whiskey or just for your digestion. And uh, you can make marmalade out of it. You can use the skin, very aromatic skin. You can make potpourri or other creative things with it. Uh, but very productive. You actually get a lot of fruit on these. And it's just so cool and so far out to see an orange tree, you know, here in the north. Um, like I say, zone six. And then after they lose their leaves, they're all contorted and super gnarly thorny. Um, deer will not touch this. And you should be careful where you put it too because you don't want to you don't want to bump into it. Those thorns do not yield. Uh, but then architecturally, it's so fascinating looking, uh, even in the winter time. And then with snow on it, it's like sculpture. And you can bonsai and play and work with these. Uh, so this is flying dragon citrus. That's about the only real cultivar I know of. Uh, the straight species is the trifoliate orange. It has straight thorns and is going to be a bigger tree. So the flying dragon citrus is curved thorns, a little more delicate. Uh, you're looking maybe six, eight feet, whereas the straight species, you know, that thing can get monstrous. You can get like 10, 12 feet tall and go wide and become like a impenetrable, you know, like, like zombie apocalypse plant. So don't put it where you need to walk, at least the straight species. These guys, again, they can be lollipopped uh, as bonsai or whatever you know you're feeling there they're a lot of fun to work with and just they're, they're show stoppers people are like what you're growing oranges in your tree and then show them your pawpaws they're gonna feel like they're in the tropics all right if you're in our neck of the woods come visit us we have a, we have a small nursery um, usually only open on weekends in the spring or by appointments I don't do any mail orders uh, so you got to come see us. It's a great time to come walk around and see the food forest and just kind of check us out. It's kind of an, an open day for our homestead. Uh, we're mostly past that now, but uh, keep it in mind for, for the future 
uh, Springs, come and visit us. Uh, and this is my, my site where you can see a lot of these fruits and other things that we've shared in the webinar, my books and our events. And yeah, love to see you guys come our way. Okay, so Michael, there were a couple questions along the way. Um, first, Al asked, when are currants harvested? Ah, good question. Um, early in June. So they're one of the first fruits. I like growing my currants, my gummies, my pawpaws all together because they're all flowering at the same time too and just creating more activity and insect life going on, uh, especially for my pawpaws. Uh, they are self-fertile, the, 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 the currants, uh, the black currant, you don't need a partner, though I do recommend, uh, you know, at least three bushes uh, for, for getting, you know, fruit that'll, that'll get you to make something. Uh, but in our neck of the woods here, June, they're, they're one of the earliest fruits we get. We get the gummies, the June berries, and the currants, uh, and the gooseberries pretty early on. They're cousin to the gooseberry, so very similar in a lot of ways. Okay, and then there are a couple questions on sourcing. Um, the flying dragon citrus, where do you get uh -huh. that? So inter interestingly enough, the flying dragon citrus is pretty common um, as an ornamental. So I've seen it, you know, in local nurseries. Uh, so you might be able to call around and find one that's, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, a decent, you know, decent size because they start small and they, mine are growing slow to start with. So that you might need a little they might need a few more years than I would normally recommend uh, to have something in a pot. Uh, Mike McConkie, Edible Landscaping Nursery, he has them. Uh, I think I've gotten a few from him in the past. So, it, and he does potted order stuff. So I would say Edible Landscaping Nursery if you can't find it local. Okay. Um, and then, you know, a few people picked up on the invasive species, autumn, mm -hmm. olive, and the gumi. So say a little bit about that. Oh, well, gosh. Um, so I observe my landscapes, you know, without, you know, forethought uh, of, of any bias and see how the ecosystems are evolving and how the different, you know, life forms around are interacting with those species. And the gumi and the autumn olive are some of the most beneficial uh, plant species on our landscapes, uh, largely for that early, strong, um, flowering and pollination when a lot of early season food is not available for the bees and other insects. They're a major awesome insectary for that. Uh, they fix nitrogen in through their roots and they support the plants around them. They sort of regenerate and heal uh, damaged earth uh, and bring it back to fertility. And they're pioneer species, so they're not going to stick around once, you know, once the birds come in there and eat and they drop their tree seeds down through those bushes those trees come out through the bushes and then over time in succession, they phase out. So they're pioneer species, you know, these are healers of damaged landscapes, you know, they're, they're, they're playing an ecological role uh, that is usually broader than, than our understandings and concepts. Um, so, I mean, everyone has a different opinion on it. Um, I see them as very beneficial uh, and, and, you know, I work with them to help heal landscapes and rejuvenate and, you know, create regenerative, you know, systems. So I, I see them as allies. Do you yeah. think there's anything people should worry about when they have them in their landscape? I mean, like I said, the gumi is not dispersive at all. Uh, it's very hard to propagate. I wish it was easier to propagate, actually. Um, I'm not, you know, for even my golden, my golden uh, autumn olive, I'm not seeing any more golden olive, autumn olives popping up around here. So not that it's not dispersive. Um, I mean, again, that's a personal decision. You know, I'm not going to say, you know, do or don't or worry about it or not. Okay. Uh, I like working with these plants um, in ways that speed up the repair that our landscapes need. And, that, and it's not going to be for all the plants that are considered invasive, of course. But, you know, the ones that are, you know, being, you know, proving themselves to really help regenerate. Yeah, I'm going to work with them. Okay, so it looks like you've hooked a bunch of people. So they're asking, is it too late to plant any of these varieties or? No, no, not at all. I mean, it gets more challenging as you get into uh, the warmer weather for planting. Uh, I like to do most of my planting in the late winter, very early spring. Um, but I will plant, you know, I mean, right now, today getting hot like this, typically this is pushing it. 
Um, I do a lot of stuff bare root. Uh, so like you can order from like Rain Tree and Burnt Ridge Nursery bare root plants. Um, and, and they'll, they'll establish better, um, when it's, when it's cooler and wet and that's what you want. Uh, but I would check with them and see if they're still shipping and they're probably, you probably be fine, especially with these characters because they're pretty tough. Uh, Gumi actually can be a little sensitive to transplanting and getting going. Um, but I would, I would, uh, I would check with, uh, what did I mention? Uh, Hidden Springs Nursery. Uh, in Tennessee, I would check with Burnt Ridge and I'd check with Rain Tree. And if they're still shipping, I would jump on there. That golden mall model is called Amber. Uh, I really like it. Uh, and then they have Gumi's. For Gumi, I recommend the Sweet Scarlet. There's, there's really only maybe three that you'll come across. Uh, and if you're limited, just go with Sweet Scarlet. They are pretty much self-fertile. So you would, you would be fine to get just one. If you have room, I would get two and I would plant them uh, close to each other. You'll get even more fruit. Um, so, you know, Red Gem and Sweet Scarlet are the two common ones. Um, so yeah, I would go for them. And then, you know, Edible Landscaping uh, in, in Afton, Virginia, he does potted stuff. So he'll keep shipping you, you know, even as it gets warmer in the summer. The trick is, as it gets warmer, you got to, you really want to water them in and keep them, you know, well watered. Um, you know, don't use municipal water, don't use chlorine to water with. That's, that's not going to help your plants. So, you know, have another water source. Speaking of harvesting rainwater, can, yeah. uh, there's a question about um, what if we they can choose between asphalt shingles or painted steel roof. Any thoughts? <laughs> uh, you know, I haven't really investigated. My my sense would be the um, would be the metal roof would probably be less less chemically. And you can design a flush system. I'm not going to get into this, but you can look it up. Where you know the first the, so when it rains, you know that first rush of water that's got most of the chemicals on it you can get a dump system you know before it goes into your barrel or something you can dump that off so it has more of the chemicals and then you can let and ideally you dump that in, into you know a little micro remediation little you know fungi filter which i covered in another uh webinar here and is in my book as well and then you know the rest of that water would would be you know would be safer uh to use you know, if you have, if you only have uh, municipal water, certainly leave it out like a five gallon bucket, let it off gas, let a lot of that chlorine and other crap, you know, kind of off gas some and then use it. Um, it wouldn't hurt to go ahead and give a little shade structure if you're planting and going into the summer now, you know, get like a tomato cage or some welded wire, you know, just put a little like shade cloth over it, at least for like a month um, would be helpful. Uh, just to keep it, you know, helping it get established using uh, seaweed fertilizer, uh, you know, like a liquid dilute, usually it's about an ounce to a gallon when you transplant. And, it, and actually, if you're getting things bare root, soak those roots, you know, before. So you get them, soak them for about an hour <coughs> in, in a bucket, five gallon bucket that's got some of the seaweed liquid fertilizer in it uh, or fish emulsion and let them soak that up for about an hour, then transplant them, then water them with that uh, liquid seaweed um, will help a lot with uh, the transplant uh, shock. All right. Any problems with ambrosia beetles? Uh, very possibly. And, you know, they're, they're a little bit of a mystery, but I think in general with them and a lot of other characters, they're going to go after things that are, are weakened. Right, so I know that they can affect pawpaw trees when they're in a wet spot. Uh, you got some wet roots fermenting. You know, kind of, they like alcohol. I think those ambrosia beetles, they go for it. Um, the ferment, you know, so keep, you know, design your systems so that they're healthy. You know, get that organic matter long-term in there. Get your swales in there. You know, get, you know, the right plant for the right kind of soils get some of these more resilient, you know, plants, uh, some of these more uncommon fruits. And, and then I think you're going to reduce a lot of your disease and your pest issues, which are going to go after things that are more susceptible, usually because they're weak or just not the right appropriate plant for the, you know, for the site or the region. Uh, back to the pawpaw, Al has another question. He says he had several second year pawpaw trees whose main terminal bud was either broken off or eaten by deer. Each has side branches with intact terminal buds. Should he prune one of these branches to encourage the other to become the main terminal of the tree? 
performance. Okay. So he's talking about the, the apex uh, as far as training it. So you can train your pawpaw trees as a central leader, or you can vase them out. Um, I do both, you know, so don't worry about not having a central leader for a pawpaw. Uh, you know, I would just, you know, if there's any twig left, I would cut just above that next side branch. Uh, and it, and, and, you know, it will then probably go vertical if it's the top one. Uh, but I actually do a lot of pruning to keep mine a little more vased and, you know, try to keep them at, I keep mine at about six to eight feet tall. And I really, you know, I really go after pruning my pawpaws because I want good airflow and I want to be able to reach all my pawpaws. Now that's more orchard style, so it's not for everybody, uh, but just know that you can, you know, shape and work with pawpaws in different ways. And by reducing their height and reducing their horizontals is helpful too. I, I try to keep my horizontal branches to four or five feet because otherwise they can get heavy and bow down and that, you know, they can touch the ground or get funky or just get in the way. So I limb up on the, on the bottoms, usually a couple of feet, no limbs. I keep my horizontal branches, you know, to four or five feet and I keep my tops to about eight. I have a couple of videos. I have a YouTube channel. You guys should look up um, where I have some different things on how I prune uh, um, pawpaws, how I graft them, et cetera, et cetera. And, if you're over there, certainly uh, subscribe. And yeah, I don't know. Did I answer that? Yeah. Um, so I think there's two more straggler questions on different berries. Um, any thoughts on sea berries, sea buck buckthorn? Yeah, sea buckthorn's awesome. Again, a nitrogen fixer, very medicinal. Uh, I've struggled to grow it here, uh, and I think that's a mixture of having a you know a heavier clay soil. Um, and it might be the heat. I'm not sure. I think they're very drought tolerant and would probably like a drier soil. So again, uh, maybe on a swale uh, or something that's well draining. I know as you get cooler, I know up in New England, they do really well. I know Ben Fox growing them really well. And I think up there was at Vermont. Um, I've seen them grow really well out in the Northwest. Um, so I would, I would go for it, uh, and maybe make sure it's got good drainage. Um, you know, I think they're probably more developed from, you know, a sandier, drier type soil climate. So cooler and sandy. So yeah, that'd be my suggestions. I've not had a lot of success with them yet in my neck of the woods, but that doesn't mean you wouldn't. Mm. Okay. And I guess this last question is a good one for, um, is there a reference list that you can circulate on resources for, uh, I mean, I, I did circulate that summary you had. It had a lot of links in it. I suppose that can be a good start, right? Yeah, there's that. I've got a lot on my website. My book has an Uncommon Fruits chapter. Uh, Lee Reich's book, I will say straight up, one of my favorite books is Lee Reich's book called Uncommon Fruits for Every Garden. That book is like, I don't know, like 13 or 14 or 15 chapters. And each chapter just talks about all of these different uncommon fruits, brings them to life in a way that you can uh, really kind of get a start to get a feel for these plants, you know, in, in, a, in an easily digested way. I really like Lee Reich's writing and um, how he gets things across. You really feel like you start to know the plant, you know, by learning from him. Uh, so I'd also, he's got a blog. Uh, I would sign up for him. And really, you know, his list of uncommon fruits is, is spot on. I mean, he's like me in the sense that he's working with what grows really well uh, without a ton of input. And he's in the Hudson Valley. He's uh, at least zone six. Uh, so that might be even a little more appropriate for some of you all. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you got to be careful when you go to some of these uh, catalogs and nurseries and, and you see all these wonderful fruits. And it'll say, yeah, you know, grows from zone four to zone nine. That does not mean it will grow well for you. I'm sorry. Uh, I think I learned that early on. Um, you know, it's not just zones. It's not just your cold uh, USDA zone. Uh, there's, there's heat and all kinds of other factors that can play into your fruits. So uh, I would say Lee Reich's books, uh, my books um, would help paint the way. And then, yeah, the stuff we've talked about tonight. Great. So 
I think that about covers everyone's questions. I'm going to unmute everybody. So if anyone wants to jump in with any final questions, you can go ahead and do that. Ooh, okay. This is a little bit chaos because yeah. sometimes when I unmute, it's quite loud in the background. So I apologize. Yeah. Let's see what happens. Okay. All right. So just a couple more minutes. If anybody has a last question they really want to answer, answer. Go Michael, ahead. Michael, did you get any any uh, freezing on your pawpaw flowers this year? I did. Um, I'm waiting to see. You know, I, I need to go out there and check to see if they've started to set their fruits yet. In past years, I in our in our area, you know, they'll they'll reflower. Uh, you know, if, if if some of my flowers get frozen, they'll reflower. Uh, but I might get less fruit. Um, so I need to go out there and check. They did get some, I'm sure. But I have so many different cultivars and varieties uh, that I've noticed that, you know, there, there was some variation in, in the timing. Uh, so, so I think diversity is maybe going to save me from, from not losing too much fruit. Yeah, I think, I think this is a, an amazing thing that, uh, that people don't know about with the pawpaw is that uh, you can lose almost 100% of the early flowers and, and the latent buds then will develop. Because I've got, we've got uh, pawpaws here we are almost in May and it's still flowering here. Yeah, so, highly adaptive species. Again, the, the pawpaw is phenomenal uh, species to work with. Yeah. I have a question, uh, Michael. I'm going to can you yes. hear me all right? This, this is Charlotte. I have a question because we have a variety of, we have a, several areas of pawpaws growing in the forest as well in areas that we've been clearing for getting a little bit of fun, but we don't know what variety we have. So how do we know which to bring in to introduce so we get better fruit? Well, you'd have to, you know, really when it comes fruiting time, um, you know, go out there and, and, you know, test them, try them, see how productive they are as well, you know, do some taste testing, um, tag your trees, uh, you know, take notes on the trees so that you, you, you remember which one it is. Um, you can, it's a little dodgy to save seeds from those and, and only grow them out as a seedling because you don't know what the other parents might be. Um, but you, you could take cyan wood, you could take a cutting off of one of those good ones um, and then graft it onto a seedling and, you know, call it shepherd's village or something. Um, you know, you know, if you have a wild patch, uh, you want it to, you want to get more sun to it if you can, and you want to thin them out. So if they're all growing close to each other, try to get at least 10 feet between them. So thin them out. So you might go in there and say, okay, well, these have good fruit. Let's make sure we save these and let's start thinning out all of these others. If there's some branches overhead, let's, let's, let's bring in some more light. And you can kind of draw out the better aspects of those pawpaw, wild pawpaw patches. You can work with them. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Michael. All right, well, thank, thank you, everybody. Yeah, yeah, it's been great, it's been fun. Really fun. And you really helped everyone out here. I really appreciate you getting us all off to a good start. Right. I think um, you got a lot of excited people. Good, 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 good. Get out there and get planting. All right. All right. Have a good Easy. summer, everybody. Thank yep. you, Michael. All right. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.